Hi everyone, and a warm welcome to Tomorrow's Tech Today, bringing you the latest in technology, talent, transformational change, and of course, tech as a force for good. I'm your host, Professor Sally Eves, and today we're discussing all things actualization when it comes to enabling sustainability impact that scales with multiple vectors of change, both positive and sometimes challenging. In this episode, we place a focus on ESG measurement and from the network up. To do this, I'm delighted delighted to be joined by the brilliant Sawa Khan, Global Head of Digital Sustainability at BT Group. We dive into all the latest innovation in this space, including BT Group's launch of a carbon network dashboard and digital carbon calculator. I personally believe these can contribute to advancing ESG measurement that is consistent, holistic and comparable. Ultimately, it's the move from ESG transparency to accountability too. So without further ado, a very warm welcome to the show, Sarwa. It's wonderful to speak to you today. Thank you, Sally. I'm very pleased to be with you. Oh, it's my absolute pleasure. And I mentioned this a little bit earlier on today. I'd love to kind of share with the audience a little bit more about your background as our place to start, if that's okay. I always think you know, sharing that personal journey to your role, particularly moments that matters along the way, can just be super encouraging for other people. So maybe that's kind of a place to start, the person behind the tech, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've been at BT now for just over three years. Uh, I've been in uh, the sustainability role for uh, 13 months or so. Uh, Prior to that, uh, I was in strategy. Uh, Sustainability was a a part of uh, the work I did in strategy. Uh, But before joining BT, I, I, I had around 10 to 11 years working in the energy industry. So um, working for brands such as E.ON uh, and SSE for E.ON. Actually, going all the way back, I I joined uh, the graduate scheme in 2010. Um, So uh, fresh out of university and um, the first placement I actually did uh, uh, in my uh, E.ON career was in a power station, a coal fired power station. To be specific, for those who know it, uh, Ratcliffe Power station in Nottingham. I did six months uh, there get, getting a real experience of the engineering aspects and the role of um, uh, fossil fuels in terms of driving um, our energy system. Um, and then from there, I did a number of other placements, one in public affairs, looking at um, uh, working with government, developing policies. Uh, and, and from there, moved on into Sweden, actually, uh, where I, I, I lived and worked for E.ON, uh, looking at uh, business models for developing and operating uh, onshore and offshore wind farms across the Nordics. Um, and, and while I was there, I also completed my master's in renewable energy at Loughborough University. Uh, and and uh, uh, I, I moved beyond that into um, consulting. We set up a new function within E.ON to look at uh, new energy solutions. So I was uh, developing propositions that looked at uh, helping consumers and small businesses and medium-sized enterprises with um, diversifying and moving into distrib- distributed energy solutions such as solar PV, heat pumps, uh, batteries, and um, electric vehicle charges. All the stuff we're talking about today, Absolutely. I was looking at um, around 2012, 2013. Um, So I did that for a while and then I moved into um, SSE, coming back to the UK in um, uh, Reading and there I was developing propositions for uh, their connected home team. So very much looking at um, the opportunity, the commercial opportunity associated with um, smart metering. So uh, for those who are familiar with smart metering, they'll know it's a regulated rollout. Uh, But beyond that, there's an opportunity to provide um, data and insights to both consumers and small businesses and I was predominantly looking at how we monetize that as 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 a service effectively um and then I guess the the moment that matters for me probably came around uh, two years ago like many others um I, I, I welcomed to the world my son who's um uh, just a little over two years ago and and um for me that was a pivotal moment because um he inspired me effectively to look for uh, doing something with um, purpose and, and leaving a positive impact on the world and, and, and making sure I played a role in terms of the, the future society. Um, so uh, it, I, I guess it was 
coincidental and and perfect that I, I was in an organization in BT that leads with purpose. You know, the, uh, uh, our purpose in BT is to connect for good, and and it runs all the way through the organization. So um, it was a really inspirational moment, and and the opportunity was perfect to move into this role. Oh, I love that. And I love that in so many different ways. A, the, well, A, very specific experience within the energy sector, which I think is fantastic, but also on top of that diversity of experience as well, both from that practical kind of hands-on sense, but also from the, from the research and the qualifications you did as well. I think that blending is always yeah. so, so valuable. And I love the hands-on kind of experiential take on that too. So I think that's brilliant. And yeah. many congratulations. Thank you for sharing that personal story as well. I think that's absolutely wonderful. And I think as well, just with children generally, you know, when I go into schools, etc., and if we kind of look at kind of at young adults, etc., kind of Gen Z or Gen Z, they really are kind of purpose by design in so many different ways, looking at things like sustainability. And it's one of their biggest kind of criteria on, on you know, who you might buy from or advocate or share about on the social, whatever it might be, really are leading the charge there. So really interesting take it in many different ways. That's brilliant. And perhaps without further ado, we should drill into this topic of sustainability in a bit more detail as well, because I know we're going to have quite a, so many questions we could go into on this it's a real pick and mix so let's drill into maybe what's been changing the most and you said it yourself about like the last two years yeah. so many things have happened you know different vectors of change and also around mm. risk you know, whether that's geopolitical or security or changing expectations and behaviors as well so many different things so from your take you know whether it's um a what or a who even or indicators of change occurring what are you seeing yeah. as those biggest drivers the biggest changes you're seeing around this field yeah, it's a really great question, Sally. There's a number of different actors, um, but it's becoming a very common theme in terms of what is driving sustainability. Um, the, the first one I'd call out actually is investors and, and just in general, the investment community. I think they've been at the the forefront of driving the agenda. Um, I, I read a stat actually is from Gartner uh, where they said 85% of um, all investors now factor in ESG performance as part of making a decision in terms of which organizations they're going to invest in. Um, and, and, and I think that is starting to materialize um, you know, there are a number of organizations who where we've seen investors over the last couple of years move away from um, because they, they they classify them as high risk investments. So I think I think the first thing is um, the the investors are, are, are driving the agenda um, and and alongside them uh, almost in parallel is uh, regulation. So um, a number of uh, governments around the world have set their own net zero targets and and they see that as critical as uh, as part of their overall growth strategy from an e um, ec economic perspective um so um there's some emerging uh, regulations coming out um definitely in in the EU and and the UK but uh, we're not too far off from seeing something also emerging in in the US uh, specifically within uh, the EU we've got the uh, CSRD uh, coming in, which will impact nearly 50,000 uh, companies. And it's not just aimed at those who um, are registered in, in, in Europe and trading there. It's also subsidiary. So you could be located anywhere around the world. But if you um, if you do business in Europe, um, then you'll also be impacted. And there's some pretty uh, big, chunky uh, requirements that they've set out in terms of demonstrating to shareholders, to consumers, and even to, to them uh, in terms of how you're performing on particularly climate change and what actions you're you're taking. Um, so that's an example in Europe. The SEC, the Security Exchange uh, uh, Committee, are also looking at introducing their own regulations. We expect to see um, some form of initial guidance uh, around summer, spring to summertime this, this year. So a lot of companies are going to be impacted. Regulation is going to drive more, more action. Um, but I think the most important one, aside from those, you know, the, the, we, we're seeing some um, uh, impact as a result of those taking action is actually consumers. Um, really good stat, you know, uh, I've seen through PwC where around more than 80% of consumers are looking to buy sustainable products and um, looking to do business with um, uh, companies with uh, ESG that runs through the heart of the organization. And ultimately, that's what fuels um, the top line, right? So if organizations want to grow, they need to make sure that they, they're catering for their customers. 
So, so true. You mentioned so many good examples there as well. And there, there's some work I'd also recommend people to check out by Refinitiv. And they've done an analysis, I think it's about 12,500 organizations and kind of compared some of their work around ESG metrics as well and kind of made it very granular in terms of comparison. So I'm sure we'll come back to that later on the measurement yeah. point, but I think you're absolutely spot on, you know, whether it's consumer take or an employee or potential customers in the future, also our ecosystem partners as well, that move from changing expectations around ESG to behavioral action that results from it, I think is so, so significant. It's that kind of quest for you know, not just transparency, but commitment and accountability around it too. So really, really interesting times and very positive drivers of change. And also some of those challenges we mentioned as well. So really interesting. And so maybe you now thinking about that, how addressing some of these needs, I thought maybe a lovely starting point is to kind of look at what you're active listening basically about what your customers at BT Group are saying you know what your employees what your partners are looking for um, around this opportunity but also the challenges where they're looking for support as well. Yeah ab absolutely and I'll, I'll tackle each one of those separately um, starting with customers um, they're looking for two things really from from BT. Um, the first one is um, BT being a responsible and sustainable supplier. That's that's uh, a key thing, and and that's part of the process when it comes to things like RFPs and RFIs, and even maintaining a long term relationship with with the organisations. They they're starting to ask these very important questions. And the second thing is, um, how can you help me, BT, uh, accelerate my own sustainability journey? So it's it's really that shared learning aspect um and and how can we work together almost in in partnership to to drive um uh, societal benefits and so that's from from the customer lens the two key things they're looking for now the employee one is really interesting actually i um i i, I think it was in fact this week kpmg released um uh, some survey results which um showed i think it was around one in three uh, gen z uh, um, uh, part, uh, candidates for new roles were declining jobs based on um, them not feeling that the organization they'd applied for a role with uh, had a strong ESG motive behind it. And I think that's that's really true because I feel uh, employees want to feel empowered. They want to feel like they're making a difference uh, for the companies they're working for and they're ultimately looking for a purpose-led organization. Um, so it's similar to what we're, we're seeing in terms of expectations uh, from our customers, but also from potential employees, talent. I mean, in uh, the, the, the war for talent at the moment is really hot. So um, being taking care of sustainability, being hot on the topic of ESG is going to be really, really important going forward from the employee side. And then finally, from a partner's perspective, just going back to that point of shared learning, I think um, partners are really looking uh, to BT for leadership, uh, but the opportunity for collaboration. So, you know, how, how do we come together to work on um, products or propositions or new services that can have an overall benefit to society? But I guess even from a commercial perspective, how coming together uh, can we create new sustainable business models that helps to fuel growth for, for them and for BT? Absolutely. It's, it's kind of what I phrased together is the rise of shared value business. And I think the resonance Absolutely. around that and in so many different areas, just take another another vector of change like with the energy crisis combined with supply chain fragility and, and the war in Ukraine as well. What we've yes. seen there, again, it's moved the dialogue into a different place where people are looking at the you know their consumption around their IT infrastructure and saying, actually, do you know what? This is better for our efficiency. It's better, again, with certain automation in this, it can free up time for more meaningful activities across that you know human machine partnership area yeah. but equally it can be good for society um reuse of, of, of tech kit and things as well so many different areas right across the life cycle but that shared value resonance is i've never mm. seen it so high so it's super interesting um and also supporting people around having agency to contribute to this as well i always think that's Absolutely. one of the biggest things you know, people want to do the right thing and it can be difficult and it's a messy challenging problem um and one very tangible example um an organization i've been working with we've been re helping to rewrite cvs so some of the points of, of reference around a role linking them into sustainable Ability, um, vision, mission, and targets, etc., that are role specific, kind of showing how you know every component part or every role can contribute to this as well. So, embedding that from the design of even CVs for onboarding, we thought was one way of tackling that a little bit differently. So, super, Absolutely. super interesting. Absolutely. Yeah. That's a great example. Uh, 
Thank you. Thank you. And kind of the by design element um, around ESG and sustainability. To, to specific, uh, so I'll say that again. And the by design element of sustainability, but also other areas of ESG as well. For me, that's right up there. So we have to bake in these considerations. And I think that's again is really interesting. And you know, maybe looking back a few years ago, for, for, for certain people like ourselves, we, you know, with that long history in this type of area, it's something we've been looking at actively. But I think maybe in more mainstream business activities, it'd been a little bit over, over there or periphery now yeah. we've got this move to truly embed it in all aspects and it's that connectiveness connectiveness isn't it that agility but they also the visibility integration to really deliver on this as well so so maybe supporting this and looking at by design what are you doing at bt specifically to kind of enable this from the roots up so to speak yeah absolutely and um Actually, I'll go back to our purpose to connect for good and, and yes. to support that, our plan, uh, we, we launched a plan in December 2021 called the BT Manifesto. And the man manifesto outlined uh, three pillars to help drive um, growth that was uh, that is focused on inclusivity, um, responsibility and sustainability. Now, under the inclusive pillar, that's all about um, uh, ensuring we uh, create an a, a inclusive and diverse future. And the second one is around ensuring tech is for good. And the final one is um, minimizing um, uh, our impact on, on the environment. Now, we, we've taken those three pillars and we've looked at, uh, as we develop new products, new propositions, new services, ha, ha, uh, what are the key underlying metrics that we can bring in from each one of those pillars as part of the process for the product managers or the proposition managers to embed into what they're developing? And, and we've put together something called a sustainability scorecard. And the sustainability scorecard, it's a really intuitive tool actually it asks the the product or the proposition manager uh, you know uh, some aspects around each one of those pillars how does this particular uh, uh, service contribute towards the manifesto and then it provides them with an output that basically says here's some areas where you can potentially improve on um, so the idea behind uh, behind this is when customers uh, buy these products from BT and services, they're safe in the knowledge that actually sustainability has been baked in from the start. So it po positively contributes towards their own sustainability ambitions and their own sustainability goals. Superb. That's really, really interesting. I think it also brings to the fore the pivotal role, really, of A, the ICT industry, but specifically within that, the role of telecoms as the catalyst. And I, I've got a book that will be coming out and I've kind of got a bit of a tagline underneath it about spreading contagion of positive change. And I wanted to reclaim yeah. that word, really. If you think about the pandemic and how that word was quite a negative one, actually, what we have seen from that is the power of coming together. And it reminded me of that as you were speaking there as well. So, yeah, absolutely, we can create that benefit. But particularly in the two sectors I've mentioned and the intertwining, the ripple effect of getting this right and enabling others, you know, from, from customers um, to ecosystem partners to make a difference and, you know, reduce consumption and various other different elements of this too. It's really clear to see. So that's very interesting too. And again, in the show notes, there's some specific stats on that as well that shows just how much of an impact we can make here over time. So we'll pop those in the show notes as well so people can see in real practical examples of the impact that can achieve. So brilliant stuff. And thank you as well, kind of for setting the scene there around some of your initiatives, starting with the manifesto. I love the scorecard example. Again, I think yeah. great for getting that buy-in as well around other, different areas of yes. the organisation and kind of benchmarking progress along the way, which I think is so, so helpful. And perhaps we can go on to your breaking news as well. Very, very recent. And this has been fantastically part of this. So two new tools that BT Group have been launching, one around the carbon uh, network dashboard, the second around the digital carbon calculator. Really, really useful, drilling into some of the needs we've already mentioned around measurement and reduction of scope three in particular perhaps we can give a high level overview of both if that would be okay and how they're supporting people and from a personal point of view going back to i know a shared interest we have and a real passion for accessibility and inclusion too i love how that calculator feature is accessible to everyone too so really 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 important step forward i think that yes ab absolutely and and really the the premise of of both tools um were based on feedback we had directly from customers in terms of the biggest challenge they faced in terms of getting to uh, net zero uh, and 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 really where most organizations are today on that journey is um, how do i collect good quality data that helps to underpin my target so if they've set a net zero target for a 
target uh, for a particular year they need to be able to to collect that data in terms of their wider supply chain and then use that as uh, as a way of baselining their overall emissions now that's easier said than done um particularly if you look at organizations where they have thousands of suppliers dotted all over the world of different sizes um so when organizations come to bt um, they want to understand what is the impact of the products and services that they're buying from us and how does that contribute towards their scope three emissions. Um, so the, the the digital carbon calculator, the, the first one, the first tool that uh, you mentioned, um, looks at the customer inventory BT in terms of uh, specific services and, and devices, uh, and it overlays uh, the carbon footprint for those and provides an estimated uh, profile for that customer in terms of uh, the carbon emissions. And the customers can use that data in a number of ways. Some of them are using it as part of um, developing that baseline that I mentioned. Um, others are actually using it to identify carbon hotspots within their uh, um, ICT environment. Um, that tool uh, is accessible for uh, BT customers, but it's also accessible to non-BT customers. In the case of BT customers, we actually have the ability to scan the customer inventory and provide that uh, data as standard. For non-BT customers, they're able to access the tool and upload their own inventory. And it's as simple as that, really. They upload their own inventory and then we're able to provide an estimated carbon footprint uh, based on based on what they upload. Um, and then moving on to the carbon network dashboard, this one is much more granular. Um, this is uh, uh, aimed at organizations who are much further in their journey and they're looking at the optimization piece. So they've kind of got to grips with the measurement aspect, but they're looking at, you know, what can they potentially tweak in, in the networking environment that can give them their sustainability gains? And uh, many of them are bridging uh, energy and net zero together in, in this instance. And, and the carbon network dashboard is, is a tool that enables them to do that. So um, it extracts real time power data from the devices within the network. I think we pull for around 12 times per hour. We then overlay the real time energy information from the grid uh, at a country level and, and bring them together. And, and what that enables organizations to do is get a much more uh, granular insight into the carbon intensity as it varies throughout the day. Um, and alongside that, um, organizations can also start planning for the way they run their networks, the way they manage the workloads and applications. Um, so we've heard some CIOs, CTOs say um, they'd like to leverage this tool to um, decide where and when they run their workloads and applications to match when there's a high proportion of renewable electricity on the grid. And, and that is... Uh, a, a real opportunity to to uh, drive and accelerate towards net zero for these organizations but before these tools existed it's very hard to get visibility of um you know your networking environment and what is happening on 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 the energy grid so effectively we're just bringing this together for our customers and making it really easy for them to um uh, accelerate their journey to net zero from from a networking perspective I love that. And thank you for immediately sharing that example as well. So I was going to come on to that because I always think it makes it really tangible when you show how that makes a difference and put that in action. So that's brilliant. And I love there as well how you, I mean, you were probably mentioning probably three of the top trends of, of certainly early 2023, really in many ways in terms of that reduction of complexity, yeah. um, the quest to integrate, particularly with things like IT and OT convergence as well. Yeah. Um, embedding sustainability by design, obviously, as, as part of our, our theme today as well, but also the need for visibility. It's absolutely key, whether we're talking around um, including inclusion of all emissions, so scope one to three, and also ensuring those are inclusive and external sources of data as well, because I've noticed that's coming out as a bit of a kind of gap area too. And certainly, again, we'll put this in the show notes as well. Um, Boston Consulting Group have got a really interesting data set around this, showing kind of the intention gap, action gap in many ways around wanting to do more, introducing measurement, mm. but maybe it's not looking at all the different areas of your estate. So what you're doing there, I think, is tackling that head on um, and also making it more easy to compare 
and be consistent around the measurement too, which again, I think is really helpful for people to make informed decisions, you know, whether you're internally in the organization looking to optimize or whether it's external and it's part of your you know, tender um, evaluation process even. It's really interesting. So fantastic to see that. Thank you so much. Um, and I'd love to go back to that theme of enabling kind of connectivity for good, really, in many different ways. It's very much your vision. And one thing I wanted to highlight, I was super impressed by this. A, that's that bringing together, and you mentioned it in your own background as well, of, of research and education, of application, and of knowledge sharing around this as well. I mean, you had a great report that's come out recently as well that's really drilled into this and looking, for example, about changing roles of CIO and how they can bring together impact for sustainability and digitalization. But also, I love the fact this has been recognized as well. Um, so, for example, perhaps you could share about the Corporate Knights Award as well, because I love the fact um, that it's recognized sustainable companies right across the world but the measurement of that is so transparent as well I think that's super important yeah absolutely and um, the, the corporate nights uh, run the awards on an annual basis um, and I think they announced the the top corporations at Davos uh, so Davos just just passed us a few weeks ago and um, we feel extremely proud as BT to be uh, recognized as being in the top 25 most sustainable corporations in the world according to, to corporate nights and and um, that's based on a number of different factors actually it's 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 the broader e ESG consideration. So it's not just um, the work we're doing on the climate side, but also the work we're doing with regards to diversity and inclusion, um, modern slavery and, and human rights. So um, it's I think that gives visibility particularly to our customers in terms of um we're not marking our own homework we you know other people are, are uh, giving us the recognition and um when they're procuring from or looking for uh, a responsible supplier then um we've got that accreditation to to back up the work that we're doing so um copper nights is a great example another one i'd like to call out if that's okay uh, sally is um cdp um, so we've been CDP rated seven years. Uh, we've been A rated on CDP seven years in a row. And that's a fantastic uh, achievement. And again, um, there's thousands of uh, companies around the world who uh, report into CDP uh, and are benchmarked and, and we're in the, the top 2% globally for, for CDP. And in fact, many of our customers actually request um, data from CDP in terms of uh, how BT is performing on, on climate. And we make that accessible as part of the supply chain leadership module. So it's a really, really important accreditation uh, and they've created a standardized framework that allows the information to be shared both across our supply chain and, and for our customers as well. That's fantastic. On so many different levels. A, I love the fact that your, your customers and partners are asking for this and they want that transparency. They want to be able to drill into that data and, and see how it's put together. And that's fantastic. From a heightened awareness point of view, I think that's really, really interesting. Um, but also the fact, as you were saying, seven years in a row, it says, it says everything um, in terms of having a deeply held commitment. Um, for action in this area that's super super important so congratulations on that and I think it's a real testament for for the team ar around these types of activities as well it really does mean such a lot um, and part of that kind of team theme in many ways is also the power of collective and um, I don't know about yourself but certainly for me I think with the pandemic if you reflect about what we've experienced over this period of time it's that power of coming together you know we've seen the art of the possible we've seen yeah. you know, acceleration in innovation curves really broken down whether that's kind of a you know, move to work from home very very rapidly which has obviously had its various evolutions since um, but also other areas as well in terms of changing you know expectations and behaviors but as part of that kind of open data sharing, the co-creativity and the collectiveness. So HPC Consortium, one really practical example of that. Some of the biggest tech companies in the world, but also, you know, individual citizen scientists, education establishments, governments, different sectors, different verticals, doing this knowledge transfer in a safe, open way. And in this case, it was healthcare, you know, shattering innovation curves around the vaccine. Let's apply that approach, you know, as a mindset, but also in practical actions to things around ESG too. So I just yeah. wanted to mention that because I'm thinking about something I read about yourself in terms of voluntary positions. So like, like myself, I, I know we both love mentoring and I really was struck by a piece talking about your role as a digital boost mentor and particularly looking at SMEs. Because again, I think it's important to look at potential differences, you know, yeah. affecting SMEs and SMBs through to enterprise. So I wonder if you could tell me more about what you're doing there and also some insights that you might have got from that process 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, as you say, the, uh, the, the program is uh, completely volunta voluntary. I've been doing it for a couple of years. And um, th the most important thing is really helping those organisations um, to set a strategy which is future fit and centres around uh, ESG. Um, and and for them is for these organisations it's not that easy to do because they can't afford to have the specialist resources, um, looking at this. Um, so uh, I mean I feel very privileged to be able to support them as part of the part of the journey uh, and and seeing many of them implement some of these strategies. But if I think about um, the difference between what I see on the multinational corporate side and where they're heading with their sustainability journey. And, and predominantly, it's, it's driven, as I mentioned earlier, by the investment community and the reg regular regulators. On, on the SME side, um, it, it's, it's not like that at all, at all. It's really a voluntary approach to sustainability. There is no regulations in place yet for SMEs. So um, they need to figure out their own uh, strategy. They uh, they need to build their own tools um, to kind of succeed in in this space. And for them, it's all about differentiation. And and um, the message I try to get across to a lot of these startups is that actually this is an opportunity. Um, many organisations at the moment are having to um, set out diversity and inclusion targets within their supply chain, and they will allocate a, a percentage to um, procurement from um, SMEs local and diverse suppliers as well form part of that and that also extends in the UK through to the uh, public sector um, so there's an opportunity to to participate in a lot of the, the frameworks and and um, RFP processes particularly if you're an SME and and uh, potentially winning the space if you're able to demonstrate that um, you are a sustainable supplier so that's one aspect to it that the, there's there's lots of opportunities emerging uh, and then beyond that um I, I referred to competitiveness, and if I just think about the hospitality industry, um, you know, um, particularly in where I live in in London, um, I'm starting to see a number of uh, restaurants really bring in their sustainability story to uh, uh, for their customers. Um, lots of farm to table concepts now now emerging, and they really want to tell that story of how they supporting um, local farmers and other local initiatives as part of their wider supply chain. So many of them actually see themselves tailoring their service um, for uh, the future customers. And, and again, it goes back to that Gen Z point that we touched on so many times throughout this conversation. Um, so yeah, I, I definitely think that sustainability should be seen as an opportunity for SME, and they don't need to wait for um, the, the regulatory aspects. You know, it should be self-driven. Absolutely. It's kind of sustainability at any size, so similar to my narrative about security and the support available for all types of organisations. I think you're absolutely spot on and kind of that changing that narrative as sustainability yeah. as opportunity, I think is absolutely huge. And particularly for you know, burgeoning SMEs where they really can, you know, embed things by design and get this right. Like we see in fintech around yeah. financial inclusion offers, yeah. for example, the speed of innovation there has really delivered results. So actually using that agility, it's not about always about lack of resource it's actually about the speed to innovate um and being really on point and aligned as you were saying like with, with gen z gen z too so really interesting opportunities there and i know we already mentioned this a little bit because it came up so naturally but have you got any other examples as well about this power of partnership we've spoken about it a little bit already and also from the voluntary sector as you were saying there with mentoring and also with ngos etc too but maybe more from an enterprise level or enterprise and say burgeoning startup what did you see there maybe organizations traditionally that would have competed coming together are you seeing more creativity to really you know tackle together and kind of go further faster by that type of approach yeah absolutely i think sustainability um kind of inspires what would have been a naturally competitive uh, area for many organizations to actually come together for common good and uh, I mean, even just within BT, if I think uh, back to the great work we're doing on on the collaboration aspect and and bringing um, the best of the startup world into the corporate world, uh, we launched the Green Tech Innovation Platform. I think it was in twenty twenty, and um, we we set out an objective to um, onboard startups who could help us with um, supporting our public sector customers on their sustainability journey, uh, and and specifically. 
as part of that program, I think we went through around uh, 45 startups from from memory and we selected two that have made it through to the final round. And now we're working with them within BT to co-develop propositions that we're taking out to our public sector customers. So um, the first one, um, IOPT, uh, we're working with them to deploy uh, uh, sensors, IoT sensors that pick up everything from temperature, humidity, air quality uh, in um, social housing. And, and the benefit associated with that from a sustainability perspective is um, first and foremost, the, the tenant health. You know, when there's things such as damp, mold, et cetera, emerging, or even ensuring fuel poverty, you know, that uh, they have um, uh, uh, heating on and protecting the most vulnerable. So there's an aspect of that, but there's there's also the, the collaboration around the big data piece and bringing all of that data in to uh, prevent engineer rollouts, you know, when there's um, a fault that could be um, resolved remotely. And so that's that's uh, through the work we're doing with an organization called IOPT. As I say, um, the second company we're working with is um, called Ever Impact, and uh, we're deploying air quality sensors uh, into um, our street hubs. So you may have seen the BT street street hubs uh, dotted around um, uh, uh, your local city, and um, you know you can connect to Wi-Fi there. You can make calls, etc. But within the infrastructure, we're deploying the Ever Impact sensors, and we're collecting that data, and we're passing that back to the local authorities, and they use that data in helping them make some informed decisions, whether that's around planning routes for um, low congestion, uh, better air quality, um, or long-term, actually providing that data back to their own citizens and uh, enabling them to make the decisions in terms of whether they want to go out um, running, for example, when there's high uh, air pollution in the environment. So that's two examples of uh, how we're collaborating with uh, two startups that traditionally you may not expect the, the telco world to, to have partnered with. That's a great example. It really underpins, I think, something I mentioned earlier, that connectivity really is. It's the overriding pillar of so many. If you look at the SDGs, Will, in many ways, yeah. it really is the crux, whether we're talking about, you know, inclusion um, and, and um, the aspects we talked about today in terms of climate. But so many of those challenges are interrelated. You can group most yeah. of them into, say, five or six, can't you? And it really shows, a bit like the WEF report that came out again just a couple of weeks ago, you know, we're, we're tackling with polycrisis here in so many different ways. Yeah. So to a Attack, to attack that and redress that balance, so to speak. We need a poly approach as well in terms of people coming together. And I uh, think what you've done there in terms of power partnerships are really, really interesting ones. So great. And we'll, we'll definitely share about those startup partnerships too. I think it's a really great example. Very exciting. Thank you. Um, and kind of leading on from that as well, there's another stat that I was looking at in terms of some research. This one was from Accenture. And it was showing, a bit like we talked about earlier about this value proposition, it was showing that organisations that had invested in ESG issues you know, fairly early on, so maybe just, yeah. just before the start of the pandemic, it's around 2.6 times more value is coming out in terms of outperformance of peers. Did that surprise you? Did you expect that? And where do you think we're going with that? Yeah, really, really great question. Um, I think this is the the, the shared values yeah. piece again, actually. And um, interestingly, we've seen kind of the, the shift of the narrative from CSR, the corporate social responsibility agenda more towards uh, having a positive impact, measurable impact, in fact, on um, uh, the social aspects and the environmental aspects. And uh, interestingly, you mentioned the, the, the pandemic there. Um, as, uh, I think a study that I've seen shows that uh, ESG stocks mm -hmm. uh, or, or the ones that embedded ESG uh, into their kind of uh, into the heart of the business operations actually were resilient over COVID and, the, and were the ones that grew over the same period. So there's definitely a link in terms of financial performance and those who have built ESG into the, the core of their, their business operations. And I, 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 and my guess is really based on what I'm seeing since the pandemic, that that trend is here to stay. And the way I look at it actually is it's about um, mitigating risks Ultimately, if if you're baking in um, those different aspects from ESG, you're minimizing your corporate risk and therefore, you know, you should be seen as being future fit. 
and and those are the stocks or the the organizations that um investors will will want to back and uh, as well as that even uh, consumers will want to buy from so it definitely has a, a, a financial performance impact Absolutely. And I think that, again, I, I, funnily enough, I drilled into some data. So with, with a financial services organisation, I was able to get access and, and do a bit of a, because I had, had a proposition, pretty much exactly what you said, that you know, could we actually prove and not just assume this is the case, but could we yeah. assume that companies kind of would do well by doing good for want of a better, better mm-hmm. way of phrasing it. And just from that, you know, individual research as well, it was absolutely echoing that pretty much across the board, you know, not just in a particular vertical or something like that. It really is showing that. And I also think, embedding these types of considerations particularly their interrelatedness also puts these organizations not from a resilient just from a resiliency point of view but also like an amidexterity point of view as well so with all these different vectors of risk of changes etc if you're embedding these right types of foundations across ESG type measures you're actually putting yourself in the right position across culture across process across tech uh, across change management and skills uplift etc to be able to navigate those types of changes you know and for your staff um, and customers as well to be, feel more confident and agile to that type of change too. So it really yeah. is, again, another shared value type of proposition that's super interesting. And I know I think we've just about got time for a couple of bonus questions, if I may. Uh, that would be fantastic. And I wanted to bring out some more around, I mean, Tech for Good has kind of imbued our conversation today, but I wonder if we could share a little bit more around that because I know we have a massive shared passion here around scaling Tech for Good and also aspects that support that, like inclusive, purposeful leadership as well. So I wondered if we could take a moment, maybe to share you know, some stories or a project um, or people that you've seen and you're like, really proud of and have made a difference. I think that's so important, that visibility and encourage other people to say hey do you know what we could do that or I could do that we could be part of that change too really great question um Sally and, and absolutely I think we're, we're both aligned on the sh- on the uh, the shared values on this one uh, one program I'd like to call out is um BT fast futures um and and this is aimed at uh, 18 to 24 year olds and and giving them the right skills um to to succeed in terms of whatever career they they choose to go in go into now um just looking at some of the key stats that I have in front of me in terms of how this is demonstrating um uh, the tech for good and 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 the work we we're doing as part of the broader ESG agenda um 64% of all participants from there are from an ethnic diverse background 65% are female, 63% are from uh, low socioeconomic status, and 7% have learning disabilities. This, For me, this is a, something I'm really proud of in terms of um, BT really supporting um, the future and, and being fully inclusive. It, go about, it goes back to the first pillar of the, the manifesto. Um, so for me, that that is something um, I also take on board personally and, and and look for similar opportunities and particularly when I do my own uh, mentoring for the SMEs I'm always looking for opportunities to to support those uh, from from uh, the ethnic diverse background in particular just coming from my own background but but also trying to promote some of the other aspects that I just talked about there. Oh, fantastic. We'll definitely share those stories as well. I think I think that's fantastic because, again, okay, when I do mentoring, one of the things that I've got this phrase that keeps coming up about click to commit. And one of the things I've seen is that particularly if you haven't, say, for example, got a particularly strong tech background uh, I've seen people like for example there's a lot of cloud skills training some of it which is yeah. completely free to access now and I had a chat about this very recently and there was this hesitation about well but I haven't got this and I haven't done that yes. and will it be okay and will I get support with that or don't I need to have done and it was this hesitation so the visibility that you know all these different you know, it's not a linear path into a particular role whether it's tech or anything else particularly today and actually do you know what not having that doesn't matter if you've got that right attitude and mindset to, to learn new things that most other things can be taught if you know what I mean and facilitated but that, that kind of curiosity and passion to learn um, I think sharing those stories of people who've gone through these types of programs can make such, such a difference it really is um, and I'll give a very quick shout out to um, around because I love the fact you picked out so many different areas of diversity as well I think that's so so yeah. important um, and what I'll mention as well is about neurodiversity because again I think that's one that sometimes is underexplored and there's an amazing program called dandelion or the dandelion program so again we'll pop some notes into into the um uh, show notes around that one too because it's just come to the uk relatively recently and i've seen some really great things there again kind of working together and such a such a positive um program and great outcomes that's brilliant to see so 
thank you so much for sharing that so well. it's brilliant and finally if i may as well um i have a little series so the, the audience um, i think would have heard me mention this at this a few times before but it's a major passion because i think when we look at changing the narrative to use that phrase again on diversity equity inclusion and belonging frankly in in tech um, and other areas as well we need to be really visible um, and show people from the broadest diversity of backgrounds you know to say, hey help people say you know see think this could be me see someone that relates whether that's from an experience point of view a background and age whatever it might be but it can help you think about things differently and be, be less afraid to reach out even as well and go mm. for support and and click to commit as i mentioned earlier so the 365 series i called it that kind of to show that you know focus days are important so as just one example girls in ict day but we need to make sure we have that momentum kind of rolling yeah. every single day of the year so i wonder if we could share maybe some recommendations you know whether you're you're um a young person at the moment a, a teen or a primary school or an older adult say looking to reskill or upskill right now what would be your how or your why even about coming into tech or exploring that or even just you know exploring new technologies and feeling more confident with using them too it doesn't just have to be about the career yeah really really good question um the first thing regardless of whether you're starting off your career or whether you're looking to reskill is you've got to follow your passion yes. and, I, and i think you've really got to have a, a love for for technology and 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 be inspired by the impact of technology and and if you are then um that's definitely the route to go down so i guess for those who are looking to start their career um my my advice would be look for opportunities for practical experience nothing can beat that and traditionally, we always think about uh, universities and, and degree and, and so on, which is fantastic. That's probably what we refer to as the, the more recognized route today. But actually, I, I see a, a really big role for apprenticeships uh, and, and the value that apprenticeships um, bring, you know, getting that hands on practical experience, spending a few years um, in a role working for um, a, a company, but at the same time um, learning on on the side as well. And I and, and I really recommend for for those who are who are interested in a technology career to to look at both avenues, whether that's um, following the the university degree route or looking at a, a apprenticeship. Just try and find an opportunity to get um, hands on and and gain that practical experience. And just thinking back to what I said at the beginning of the conversation. The the biggest value for me was to spend six months uh, in a coal fired power station doing shifts from um, nine p.m. to six a.m. Um, so nothing can beat that. Uh, for those who are looking to to reskill, I think um, it's never too late. Uh, technology actually moves at pace and it's moving even faster now. And you know, there's so many great problems to be solved, climate change being being one of them. Um, and I think it's really just finding, um, you know, w w where do you want to play a role? Um, you know, what are you really passionate about? And then it's setting out a, a personal development plan, really, um, you know, being clear in terms of what's required to get into that role. Um, is there a specific skill set you need to have? Um, or is it more experience based? Um, and and you know can you get get a mentor potentially who's from that particular area that you're interested in and i think if you have that plan in place um it can help you succeed because you'll have some milestones that can um be your guiding light effectively to to get you to where you need to be um so yeah my my, my really big takeaway for those who are looking to reskill is please please um put a personal development plan in place it's really important Absolutely. It's similar in a funny way that the analogy earlier with the scorecard that we were talking about, mm. um, whether you're talking about kind of buy in and getting other people involved and seeing the progress yeah. and moving on or whether it's an individual one, you can see your own personal milestones along the way. Absolutely agree with you. And I think a couple of other quick kind of points thinking about what you said, absolutely about the importance of mentorship and equally kind of going beyond that to sponsorship as well. So, for example, if you see someone you think, you know what, they'd, they'd be a fantastic fit for yeah. a keynote or a panel or a promotion, whatever it might be or you know a, 
a secondment even to get hands on practical training, whatever that might be. But going that extra mile, because sometimes it's a confidence thing. And that's my other my other key point here as well. Help people be curious to continually learn you know, that learning for life. I think that yeah. phrase has never resonated more to supporting people, not just with skills access, but with the skills, confidence to apply them as well. So you know, I talk about steam a lot. So some mm. of the arts type skills around emotional intelligence or, or you know, EQ, but also problem solving, communications, etc., can help you navigate these changes and, and to reach out and communicate and to share these stories in, in the right type of way and get support when you need it. I think that's really important. And I'd also recommend people looking out for metacognition. I'm not particularly a gym person, but this is like a gym for your brain, basically. It helps you kind of identify, you know, we talk about smart tech, but it's like smart learning strategies and helps you kind of understand, you know what, am I a linear learner? Am I more I'm kinetic? You know, like I do that a lot yeah. when, I, when, I'm, when I'm doing keynotes, but we're all different. But you know what? They're all equally valuable. And I think sometimes traditional curriculums don't have enough space to be able to support that. It's very hard. We all know the challenges um, are around that. So anything we can do to support that with free resources and training to help you understand that and work, find out what works for you, helps you to be a smarter learner alongside the smarter tech too. So again, gives you that confidence. So we'll put some assets around that too. So hopefully that might help one of our listeners and viewers today. It'd be great to be able to share that and do that. Brilliant. Fantastic. Well, I know we're at the end of our, our time today, so it's been fantastic. And I would definitely love to revisit the conversation. And I think with the kind of the speed, the scope and the scale of changes we're seeing in this space, it's one to re continually re revisit and also share more of these impact stories along the way, because that's how we can come together. And that's the most important thing, I think, around SDG action is that power of coming together and combining you know, technology change is a great enabler but with support for people, the culture, the process, the change management, etc., that brings all these elements together and of course you know as per your two launches support around the measurement of change in these areas as well because again that's how we can continually improve and innovate around this too and create that shared value we've been talking about today absolutely it's been a real pleasure thank you very much for having me sally Oh, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And thank you all for watching and listening today. And as I mentioned throughout, lots of examples in this episode, which I absolutely love. So we'll be sharing some of those um, also in places like LinkedIn and Twitter, et cetera, too. So you can bring some of those stories for life um, and also links to the new announcements as well around the dashboard and calculator launches. So much um, information here and also education as well. So we'll also share some of the skills resources, too. And as I always say, all follow up questions are really welcome. So thanks so much for your engagement and questions. We really do appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks for listening to this episode of Tomorrow's Tech Today. If you enjoy what we're doing, please subscribe to us and leave a review. It really means a lot. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and see more behind the scenes video footage on YouTube. Thanks for listening.